Good morning, and uh, welcome to our MDICX webinar. Thank you for joining our MDICX webinar announcing the release of our surrogate samples harmonized education. My name is Carolyn Hiller. I'm the program director for our clinical diagnostics initiatives here at MDIC. It is a privilege to work with the dedicated volunteers and verb involved in our different work streams. Okay. I'd like to introduce today's panelists. We have Tim Stenzel, and Tim joined the FDA in July of 2018 and has an extensive background spanning more than 20 years in executive academic and industry leadership, innovation, next generation sequencing and molecular diagnostics, companion diagnostics, global clinical laboratory and manufacturing operations, global research and development, FDA and international regulations, kit and laboratory to develop test regulatory authorizations, and commercial launches. He received his MD and PhD in microbiology and immunology, focused, focusing on the molecular biology of DNA replication from, from Duke University, followed by a Duke pathology residency, and then genetics and clinical molecular diagnostics fellowships, followed by a faculty appointment in the Duke University School of Medicine prior to joining industry. As the OIR director, Dr. Tim Stenzel advises CDRH leadership on all regulatory, pre-market and post-market, in vivo diagnostic, radiological medical device, and radiation emitting product issues that have an impact on the center and agency level decisions, policy development, nationwide program execution, and short and long-term program goals and objectives, as well as providing executive leadership and scientific direction for the OIR staff. We also have April Viocas. Uh, April is the Director in Regulatory Affairs in Abbott Regulatory and Regulatory quality and regulatory, excuse me. During her more than 25 years at Abbott, she's held positions in regulatory affairs, technology acquisitions, and research and development. In her current position, she represents Abbott in trade associations, is responsible for regulatory intelligence, and formulates company responses to proposed regulatory policies. April is the chair of our surrogate samples working group and is also chairing CLSI's EP39 surrogate sample chain work framework working group. Marina Kondratovic is an associate director for clinical studies in the Office of In Vitro Diagnostic and Radiological Health. She joined the agency in 1999, first providing statistical reviews for the diagnostic devices in Division of Biostatistics, CDRH. She moved to OIR in 2009. Her special attention are designs of clinical studies for diagnostic devices, including studies for personalized medicine tests, CLIA waiver and point of care studies, migration studies, studies for medical tests based on classifiers, post and post-marketing studies. She's interested also in statistical issues in diagnostic devices um, in the clinical studies. She's been FDA spokesperson at multiple FDA advisory panel meetings. She's experienced in developing the concepts and designs of studies for analytical validation of the medical tests. For example, analytical studies for evaluation of limit of blank, limit of detection, limit of quantification, precision, linearity, and total error. We'll reserve the last few minutes of this uh, webinar for question and answer. Please enter your questions in the chat box on the bottom of the screen. And now I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Stenzel. Thank you, Carolyn, and hello, everyone. I'm glad you could join us. So um, MDIC uh, it was formed in uh, 2013 and was the first ever public-private partnership created for the, uh, with the sole objective of advancing medical device regulatory science. Regulatory science is the science of developing new tools, standards, and approaches to assess the safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of FDA-regulated products. 
Patients benefit uh, by speeding access to important technologies, um, and device manufacturers, laboratories, and government agencies benefit from the reduced time and resources needed for device development, assessment, and review. NDIC's focus is on regulatory science. Simply put, NDIC's focus is on science, not policy. Next slide, please. NDIC has a robust program portfolio focused on a number of initiatives. The Somatic Reference Samples Project is one of their clinical diagnostic projects. You can learn more about NDIC's program, programs by visiting, visiting their website as listed on this slide. Next slide. As NDSC's focus is on regulatory science, the goal of the clinical diagnostics program is to, number one, foster innovation and speed access, patient access to new IVD tests. To do this by developing new tools and methods that will improve processes that lead to safer, more effective uh, diagnostics that have a secure value proposition. And of course, for, this is all for in vitro diagnostic tests. Next slide. The Clinical DX program currently has six active projects focused on regulatory science. They include this uh, surrogate samples framework. Today, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, we are releasing the final deliverables for this project, specifically harmonized educational modules these educational modules were collaboratively developed by and for industry and the FDA. These modules will help IVD de test developers and regulators apply the surrogate samples framework in their IVD test development and regulatory submissions. Uh, another project is the clinical evidence framework. It, uh, the framework is soon to be released uh, to help IVD test developers consider uh, how to develop their evidence for analytical validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility simultaneously instead of sequentially. This would uh, help to compress the timeline and decrease costs of evidence development. Another project is the IVD Real World Evidence Framework. Uh, it will cover ways to include IVD real world evidence in IVD de uh, test development and regulatory submissions. A draft of the framework is expected to be released for public comment this summer. Next, the finger stick blueprint will develop study designs for capillary whole blood collection using a finger stick. It will focus on precision and method comparison tests for analytical validity. A draft will uh, be released in the near future. The somatic reference samples project uh, is in the first phase of developing physical reference samples to be used in validating NGS-based oncology tests for solid tumors. The first phase scoping the work will be wrapped up uh, in the third quarter of this year. And finally, uh, the project uh, SHIELD. SHIELD stands for Systematic Harmonization and Interoperability Enhancement for Lab Data. This project is in partnership uh, with our office uh, OHT7 OAR, and a broad group of stakeholders. Harmonization and interoperability of laboratory data is a critical step in making IVD real-world data more useful. Now I'd like to turn over um, uh, the presentation to our working group chair, April Lucas, um, and uh, who will tell us about surrogate sample frameworks. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm happy to be here to, today to talk about the uh, initiative on surrogate samples. Um, as, as most know, IVD development and validation relies on biological patient specimens. When these materials are in short supply, surrogate materials or samples provide a source to develop innovative and improved diagnostics, thereby increasing patient access. Absent guidelines, the use of surrogate samples may result in regulatory uncertainty, the need to repeat studies, and inefficient use of biological test materials. The surrogate sample workgroup established a foundational framework 
to promote efficiency and improve dialogue when surrogate samples are used to support IVD validation. Next slide. To support implementation of the framework, we are announcing today the release of the surrogate sample training videos. A shared understanding of terminology and application of the framework between regulators and test developers has been an ongoing goal of this project. To further accomplish the shared understanding, our team has developed a six module video training session. This training walks through the elements of the framework and demonstrates its application with five separate case studies. Each of the videos may be accessed separately, allowing users to refer back as needed. This design was intended to help facilitate use of the framework. This training has been designed for use by FDA and test developers to further foster a common understanding and application of the framework. Next slide. Uh, before going into some details of the framework, I'd like to recognize the members of the work group. Um, as you can see, industry, FDA, and uh, expert advisors were engaged on this project. The framework, the content that we will review today, and the educational modules are the results of discussions, vetting, and collaborations of these individuals who participated on this work group. And I'd like to personally extend my thank you to all the individuals who have been engaged um, in, this, in this process, um, the development of the framework, um, development of the case studies, and um, ultimately this educational uh, training tool, which we are uh, releasing today. Next slide. Before discussing some details of the framework, I wanted to spend a few minutes describing what the framework is and uh, what the framework is not. First, one of the key objectives was to establish common language to facilitate and guide discussion in this area. When we first came together as a team, a number of terms were being used, surrogate, contrived, altered, pooled, and spiked were some examples of the common terminology used in the space. We found it important to align on definitions and terminology as a key element of the framework. Next, we look to strike a balance between general information to guide decision processes related to the use of surrogate samples while recognizing that there are exceptions or alternative considerations for specific study types. And although the framework includes information by study type, for example, linearity, um, precision, it is not intended to provide all the elements of study design that one should consider. So it's important to recognize that this information is available in other standards or, or guidelines and that the intent was not to get into this level of detail with this framework. Lastly, we centered on a hierarchical approach to the selection of the appropriate type of surrogate for um, a particular study type. Next slide. The framework establishes the following definition of a surrogate sample. Material or combination of materials that is used as a substitute for body fluid or tissue taken for examination from a single human subject to study the characteristic of interest. The definition is then supplemented with some examples, um, which would include pooled patient specimens of biological origin, uh, material created to have properties of interest of a body fluid or a tissue, material supplemented or, or spiked with an analyte of interest, and material comprised of a combination of an analyte that stimulates the analyte of interest and a material created to have properties similar to or representative of the body fluid or tissue. Equally important to what is a surrogate sample is what is not included within the definition. Preparing an analyte for the measurement with collection or storage material or the pre-analytical steps 
would not meet the definition of a surrogate sample. Also, patient samples, which would include prospectively collected and tested specimens, prospectively collected but retrospectively tested patient specimens, and archived specimens are not within the definition of a surrogate sample. To promote more efficient study design and reduce inefficient use of biological test materials, the surrogate sample framework focuses on the following key elements. It creates a uniform definition of surrogate samples and provides a diverse array of examples. It outlines general principles and considerations when designing and selecting surrogate samples. It presents a hierarchy to aid in the selection and design of surrogate samples. And then it establishes study specific principles accompanied by a hierarchy for each study type, such as a linearity hierarchy, a hierarchy for specimen stability, a hierarchy for reagent stability. Next slide. This table taken from the framework describes the um, hierarchy and it presents a decision tree beginning with a patient sample and then moves on to considerate, considering whether one should begin with a pool or an individual sample. This is based on the study specific principles that are articulated in the framework. What the training module does is takes individuals and walks through the steps of this framework in terms of how it applies uh, generally, and then it will extend to application of specific case studies. Next slide. The framework um, also includes identifying preferred approaches related to dilution to minimize the effect of, uh, of the dilution and um, guidance for when spiking materials to preserve matrix integrity. This information is also covered in, in the training modules in more detail. Next slide. And then this study specific hierarchy, again, walks through each uh, study type and presents another level of detail um, that um, serves to walk individuals through uh, the considerations that are unique to each of these uh, study types. So it begins with the uh, general hierarchy, but then moves into a more specific uh, discussion based on each of the study types. And this too is uh, explained more in the training modules, which um, are now available. Next slide. The training video describes in more detail the general hierarchy, the surrogate sample preparation guidelines, and the study specific principles, followed by application in five specific case studies. With the launch of the training video, the framework's benefits will be further realized. The training is intended um, for, for industry and specific functions to consider would be R&D, uh, clinical, regulatory, and medical affairs. The training is also intended for laboratory researchers and um, FDA reviewers. Use of the training module in conjunction with the written framework will further consistency in the application and implementation of a predictable regulatory pathway for the use of surrogate samples. Next on the horizon is converting the framework into a CLS guideline, EP39. This guideline is currently under development by a diverse and talented group of volunteers and will be available for public comment in the fall of this year. CLSI is targeting release of the final guideline to be in the second half of 2020. Now I would like to turn the presentation over to Marina Kodratovich to provide information about the case studies. Uh, good afternoon. Next slide. In next few slides, uh, I will introduce uh, five case studies. These are chlamydia test and analytical study precision or reproducibility, 
case number two, creatinine test, also the same type of study, analytical precision, reproducibility. Third case, chlamydia test, but type of analytical study is different, instrument carry over. Case number four, total PSA test. We consider analytical study precision reproducibility. And case number five, albumin test for method comparison study. Next slide. Ideally, we need to know analytical performance characteristic of the IVD test for the patient samples. Therefore, every time when we would like to evaluate some analytical performance characteristic, we need to ask themselves, can we do this using individual patient samples? Therefore, in the hierarchy of samples, we need to start always with what we call A1 in our uh, table, which was introduced by April. A1 is meaning individual patient samples. These samples can be fresh, prospectively collected, if it's difficult to have these samples, archive samples can be considered. As usually, hierarchy means that if it's difficult or impossible to perform analytical study with patient samples, then we need to consider surrogate samples. So the basic idea in preparation of surrogate sample and in hierarchy, which was introduced uh, in the table in slide before, is that we need to prepare surrogate sample in such a way that they mimic patient sample as close as possible. Slide number four, next slide. So this five case studies describe steps in hierarchy table in great detail. In the end of the steps, we will have the best scenario for this particular test for this particular analytical study and for this type of specimen. Why these uh, five uh, cases were uh, selected? What is something special in these five cases? We try to cover with these five cases a lot of different um, features which you need to consider when you design your analytical study with surrogate samples. So these five uh, cases, uh, really cover different type of in vitro clinical tests with regard to, like do we have qualitative tests, like binary tests with two uh, output, like positive uh, negative, or we have quantitative tests, or we have semi-quantitative tests. And these five cases really cover qualitative tests. We have case number one, chlamydia test for precision and chlamydia test or carry over, this is qualitative test. Quantitative test is uh, covered in three examples, creatinine test, total PSA test, and albumin test. Next slide. These five cases also cover different type of specimens. So in these cases, we have three different type of specimen, urine, Urine was considered for chlamydia test in precision. Urine was considered for creatinine test also in precision study. Urine was uh, for albumin test. We have a vaginal swab specimen. Vaginal swab was for chlamydia test uh, for precision. And vaginal swab was for chlamydia test for carryover. And we have a type of specimen like serum. Serum was considered in total PSA test. Next slide. Of course, we consider, like you see, different types of analytical study. There are a lot of different analytical study, like linearity, interferences, but we decided that uh, very frequently, uh, precision, method comparison is really uh, require um, surrogate sample. So precision study was considered for three cases, chlamydia test, uh, 
prietenii pers e nostru tot al piesei. Chiar eu vă o să considerăți foc la media test, e în mesut cam pers să nu vă focis number 5 album in test. Next slide. Also, uh, in our cases, um, we decided to bring this message that even if we have the same test, the same type of uh, specimen, but if you have different analytical studies, it can happen that one type of surrogate sample, which are the best mimic patient sample for one type of analytical study, maybe it can be not the best case for another uh, analytical study, even we have again the same test and the same specimen. So in our five cases, we have, for example, when we have the same test, chlamydia test, but it was different analytical study, precision and instrument carry over. So in this uh, training material, you can see how uh, different type of the analytical study effect on what will be the best surrogate sample that mimic patient sample in the best way. Next slide. In next uh, few, uh, in next slides, uh, I will describe you uh, what you, uh, what kind of challenges we can see with in each case study, and then in this training material you will see how uh, these challenges uh, were solved with this. Uh, surrogate sample framework. Case study one is for chlamydia test. This is the qualitative test, what we can call sometimes binary. It means that this test has only two outputs, positive and negative. Type of study was precision, or of course particular type of precision reproducibility, so everything what is um, um, valid for precision study, of course it's also valid uh, and for reproducibility study, I mean with regard to uh, surrogate sample. Type of specimen for this uh, case study, it was two different type of specimen, urine and vaginal swab. Challenges uh, in for chlamydia test for precision study, let me remind you that in a precision study, uh, we need to have sample which we call negative. This sample uh, needs to be what we can call zero concentration of analyte. So what we measure in chlamydia test and we absolutely uh, need to know that the value of this test concentration is definitely zero. Low positive, it means that the sample relatively close to the uh, cutoff in such way that 95% um, maybe of the time results will be uh, positive and only 5% are negative. Medium positive, this is the sample which are further from the cutoff uh, but not very far from the cutoff. So, but percent of positive it, it should be 100%. Uh, and high positive is really very far from the cutoff. Also, remember that in precision study, we really need to have a lot of replicates of the same sample. Uh, and this sample should be tested in different days and different sites. So what kind of challenges we have? We see that, yes, usually if I, if I try to use individual patient sample, we can have problem like insufficient volume because we need to have a lot of replicates. We need to send this uh, individual patient sample to the um, uh, different site and this individual patient sample should be uh, stable. Can I do this with the individual patient sample? Probably not. So there are issues with stability uh, of sample. Interesting that qualitative test and especially like chlamydia test has issue with true negative sample because really we don't have a reference method, uh, even a, a test which we cleared uh, or uh, we have some other uh, method like culture, they still can have negative results for the sample 
if I measure, for example, the sample only one time. So to really select individual patient sample and we absolutely know that the sample is really have zero concentration, is really very difficult issue. And you will see in training material how surrogate sample can help to solve this issue. Low positive sample is also not easy to prepare with individual patient sample because even we decided to combine, for example, patient sample, which already started to be like surrogate sample. April described you that if we pull the patient sample, it's already um, surrogate sample. Of course, in our hierarchy, it's really uh, very close to the patient sample, but still it's already surrogate sample. But for qualitative test and combining a patient sample and obtaining sample close to the cutoff, it's not really easy because it's not quantitative test. So signal um, for this uh, samples and can I use the signal in order to understand in which proportion we need to pull the sample in order to have sample close to the cutoff. No, this is not easy issue for the qualitative test. So you see that kind of uh, challenges we have in this case study, and then uh, in the, your uh, in training material you will see how we uh, came up to the best surrogate sample for all uh, four type of the samples: negative, low positive, medium positive, and high positive. Next slide. Case study two is about creatinine test. This is quantitative test. It meaning that we have numeric value for this test from uh, measuring intervals, from low limit of measuring interval to the upper limit of uh, measuring interval. Type of study, uh, precision reproducibility study, and type of specimen, male, uh, and female urine. What challenges we have for um, precision study for creatinine test, test? For measuring interval, we need to have sample with some kind of like almost cover this measuring interval and we need to know uh, precision in this uh, sample. So concentration of sample should be close to the low limit of the measuring interval close to the upper limit of the measuring interval. Usually quantitative test has at least one uh, medical decision level. And requirement for the sample which should be included in precision study for one medical decision level. It will be sample below this medical decision level and above the medical decision level. So you see that one of the challenges that it's not only we need to have sample in the precision uh, sample, but we need to have sample with some particular concentration. The same like what we discussed uh, for case study number one, this is the precision study. It means that we need to have a lot of replicates for different days. So one of the challenges is the uh, volume of the sample. And of course, if we use individual patient sample, volume is not enough, sample is not stable. So in this uh, uh, case study in training material, you will see how uh, all these challenges were solved with uh, surrogate sample. And again, if you use hierarchy, uh, according to the table which was uh, presented by April, this will be the best available surrogate sample which we can uh, have for this type of um, uh, test, for this type of study, for this type of specimen. Next slide. Case uh, study number three is chlamydia test, but type of the study is different. This is the carryover study. And let me remind that the basic idea of the carryover study is that you need to have first measure only negative samples. Uh, and then we see that, yes, we hope that all this negative sample 
will give me only negative results. Then we need to have few runs where uh, this will be like um, uh, um, alternation of the negative sample and this negative sample should be uh, surrounded by the positive sample. But this positive sample, it should be really very, very high positive sample. So high that it should be high at least like maybe 99 or 95 percent of positive sample in the intended use population. So you see that for carryover, we have uh, uh, issue with uh, samples. We need to have negative sample, and we need to be absolutely sure that this sample is really true negative. Because if we observe for negative sample positive results, then of course this positive result will have interpretation that carryover uh, effect is present. So we really need to be sure that this negative sample is really true negative sample. That concentration is really zero. And for chlamydia, for qualitative test, it's not easy issue with individual patient sample. In uh, carryover, we need to have a lot of replicates of the high positive sample. We need to have a lot of replicates uh, negative sample. So it will be an uh, issue with volume if, if I try to use individual patient uh, sample. So in case uh, study number three, uh, in training material, you will see how we solve this issue with surrogate sample. And of course, I'm encouraging you to look what kind of differences you can have in surrogate sample if you compare uh, analytical study like precision and analytical study like carryover for the same test and for the same type of specimen. Next slide. Case study number four is about total PSA test. This is quantitative test. It means that this test has measuring interval. Type of precision, type of analytical study is precision reproducibility study. And type of specimen is serum. As usually for uh, quantitative tests, in the precision study, we need to have samples which cover uh, measuring interval. So we need to have sample close to the low limit of measuring interval, close to the upper limit of measuring interval. And this case is also interesting that for total PSA, we have multiple medical decision level. It's not like maybe only one. So in precision study for each medical decision level, we need to have sample uh, with concentration close to this medical decision level. As usually in precision study, we need to have a lot of replicates. So it uh, can be issue with volume if I try to use individual sample. And we require that this uh, stability, uh, that this uh, precision study will be conducted at different sites, different days, so uh, stability of sample. So when you will see case study four in training material, you will see how we um, uh, address all these challenges with surrogate sample. Also, please pay attention that uh, Really, even if we have um, different medical decision level, but type of the surrogate sample, the best surrogate sample, which mimic patient as, as close as possible, are really different. Like, for example, if we have um, concentration like close to the upper limit of measuring interval, you will see that the best available surrogate type of sample is different compared to the sample surrogate sample which are close, for example, to medical decision level of 4 nanogram per ml. Next uh, slide. Case uh, study number five is uh, albumin test. This is quantitative test. It means that we have a measuring interval and in method comparison study, which was considered in this case study, 
we really need to cover uh, measuring intervals with different uh, patient samples. Type of specimens is urine, and in this uh, case, you will see how we try to see, do we really have any challenges? If I try to use individual patient sample, like again, we need to have concentration of samples that uh, should cover uh, the measuring interval. Can I have this with individual patients? Yes, it's not difficult to find concentration of samples that cover the entire measuring interval. Volume. Do I have problem with the volume? No, this is not precision study where I need to have a lot of replicates. In, in comparison study, I need to have only one measurement of the candidate and one measurement of the comparator. This is type of specimen urine. Usually it's enough volume to have uh, one measurement for the candidate and one measurement of the comparator, namely because of type of specimen is urine. Stability of samples. Probably it also will be not issue. Why? Because uh, I need to have only one measurement of candidate and one measurement of the comparator. So all this uh, measurement can be done uh, almost for simultaneously. Or if I need to have um, to transport the sample. Uh, maybe to have um, different places where comparator method can be used. Then maybe can be an uh, issue with some individual uh, patient samples. But usually candidate and comparator can be uh, measured maybe on the same place, so there are no issue with stability samples. So in this example, you will see that surrogate samples are not generally needed. Of course, in your particular case, with your particular comparator, maybe still you need to have some surrogate samples, but at least in this example, we would like to give you idea that sometimes really individual patient sample are the best, which mimic patient sample in the best way. So if you don't need to have surrogate sample, it's good. Next slide. So right now time is question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. And um, if anybody on the call has questions, please enter them into uh, the chat box and we can answer them with the panelists. Um, this is the URL uh, where the videos will be available and um, I encourage all of you to um, to view them and to uh, share this resource with your colleagues. There will be six modules. One of the videos will be an overall view of looking at um, using the framework, how to apply it. And then there will be the five individual case studies that we um, covered uh, in this webinar. The videos should be available now. Um, at the website, and um, I will be following up with an um, email to the end, all of those who registered um, where the information is. So um, outside of the question that I've seen of when they are available, um, the slides that we have here um, that we have used, um, we, uh, we can make those available. Um, the recorded video of this webinar will be on the archive, so that will be available for viewing. And um, I see a question here on case study number five, method comparison. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be relevant to use an example with quite well-known issues, such as vitamin D, which can give very severe matrix effects and discrepancies from one assay to the other and still require surrogate samples to cover the higher part of the measuring range. Yes, this is really a very important question and it's uh, not easy uh, to answer because if you have a matrix effect, 
it meaning that uh, when you started to compare uh, the surrogate samples with your candidate and comparator, you have uh, some kind of differences between these um, two methods, but it's really not because of um, a method, but because uh, maybe how you prepare the surrogate samples. Uh, yes, it's not easy because, uh, but if you don't have patient sample in this range, maybe you can uh, do some kind of with statistic, but of course, uh, that m maybe we can try to understand what kind of this interference is because really what we need to know is uh, what is the difference between method for the patient sample. And if you prepare in surrogate sample and there are some different what we can call random interferences effect. This type of the comparison study is difficult uh, with using of surrogate samples. And I know that sometimes uh, for method comparison, we, you created surrogate sample and we do in regression analysis separately for patient samples, separately for surrogate samples. And we see that surrogate samples behave differently. They are not reflecting patient samples. It's difficult what we can do with this information. So I recommend that we can discuss this uh, particular case maybe with FDA through pre-submission process. Thank you, Marina. Um, we have another question that this reminds me of migration studies guidance from FDA a number of years ago. Will you update that guidance as well as produce the CLSI guidance? Uh, we can update like we can make reference to uh, EP39 or maybe to material which already on the MDIC uh, website, but uh, it's uh, I think that we maybe don't need to update because basic idea is telling that you can definitely use surrogate sample with hierarchy, which you already see that try to have individual patient sample fresh. If you don't have, try to have archive patient sample. If it's very difficult, you can have surrogate sample. So uh, that, that is all that uh, it's written that you can use surrogate sample. Uh, there are not a lot of details how to prepare this surrogate sample for precision, how to prepare sample for method comparison study. So EP39 will provide for you all these details. And practically there are no any difference. Well, are you doing migration comparison study or are you doing uh, usual uh, comparison study for 510K? Preparation of surrogate sample is the same principle. Thank you, Marina. And um, the CLSI EP39 uh, surrogate sample framework is projected to be released in the fall of 2020. Um, it will be going out for uh, public comment uh, before that time. So uh, check with the CLSI website on the status of uh, that coming standard. Um, uh, Carolyn, this is April. Yes. I just it relates to EP39. Uh, I just wanted to add a few words. Um, right, as you stated, um, it is currently um, being drafted. There, there is a, um, a, a large team, a very good uh, set of uh, volunteers um, to, who have agreed to participate in the development of converting this framework from NDIC into a CLSI guideline. And um, um, the, intent, the intent is that this will be available for public comment uh, this fall. And then uh, with a final document uh, targeted for release, again, fall of 2020. And then um, it is um, our hope that this would then be adopted by the agency. So I guess as a, um, a stakeholder, um, you know, we would be working to help um, position this as, as something that uh, could be adopted uh, by the agency and um, that would help to further extend uh, the application of the, the framework and, and the processes um, in, a, in a larger way from a, a regulatory uh, 
uh, predictability aspect. Yes, because uh, another uh, important point that in FDA we have this uh, process, what we can call a CLSI document can be recognized by FDA. It means that we like what is written in this uh, document and we have two options, uh, complete recognition of the document or maybe only partial, maybe some pages or some section will be not recognized. We hope that EP39 will be recognized complete. So uh, it means that you can use uh, um, recommendation which provided in this CLSI document and uh, this will be uh, accepted by FDA. But it meaning also that uh, we will review very carefully what will be in uh, f uh, final EP39 and uh, a lot of people from FDA involved in writing this document. So we hope that we will have useful document for the industry and for FDA. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? It's your last chance for the uh, um, for the, uh, the attendees to ask a question to the panelists. Okay, I'm not seeing any more. So I want to remind everybody the recording of this webinar will be available uh, shortly, and um, and remember that you can download. Um, the uh, framework. Um, if you don't remember the URL earlier, you can Google surrogate sample framework and it should be a top hit. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions. And thank you very much for participating and do share these educational uh, modules, uh, the reference with your colleagues. We want as many people to be able to use them as possible as it will help get uh, IVD tests to patients uh, faster. It's going to compress your, your development timelines and provide a more predictable path um, in the reg regulatory submission. So thank you very much and I wish all of you a very good day. Goodbye. Goodbye.